Thank you, Fiona. And, and what was wonderful about that last session, well, one of the things that was wonderful, was not just the emotions aroused by the, the winners, but the emotions that what they do arouse in, in all of us. But, as Fiona said, we are now going to introduce to you somebody who is par excellence, a, a man who's devoted his whole life to sustainability. Um, he is somebody who's so famous, uh, so important, that there is about to be a full-length uh, feature movie uh, which is going to celebrate his life. It's uh, produced by Angelina Jolie. Uh, he, our hero is going to be played by none other than Brad Pitt. To introduce him, ladies and gentlemen, is our own WTTC star, our own matinee idol, uh, one of the founders of the WTTC, one of the uh, former chairmen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Kent. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, it, uh, it really gives me a lot of pleasure this evening to be sitting here to really introduce my old childhood friend who's become so famous. Uh, Richard, um, who you'll meet in a minute, has uh, been a safari operator, an anthropologist, a conservationist, a politician, an author, and a professor. So um, we have many things in common, Richard and I. We went to, we're born in Africa. We went to the same school together. We were both left school early. I was thrown out. He just left, I think. Um, we both spoke Swahili. Um, and we both went in the safari business. And we both rode horses. And we both fell off and cracked our heads and survived. So there's one very big difference. As Nick said, Rich has become extremely, extremely famous. And I'm not. Richard, come on. <laughs> Come here, Richard, have a seat. Thank you. Have a seat there. Okay? Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. So, Richard, very, very first question. When we were young, we used to ride horses, and of course, there weren't many people around those days. I remember we used to ride out the Ingong Hills, and I think your favorite trick was to gallop up and hit a rhino on the backside. Do you remember that? Unfortunately, yes. I was very young, I was very thin, and Kent was much better looking than I was, and we usually had a gaggle of girls with us. <laughs> the only way I could get attention was do things he was too scared to try. <laughs> Richard, just give us a very brief, just two seconds of your background, you know. How your early life in Kenya is different from probably everybody sitting in this room. What was the difference? Well, it was a colony. It was racially segregated. Um, my parents, my father in particular, was identified with the Kenyan nationalism. I was very unpopular because I had African friends. I was called a nigger lover. I hated school. I never understood why one should be asked to solve mathematical problems when the person asking you clearly had the answer already. It's in a total waste of time. I couldn't understand why one had to kick a ball and then run after it. Um, it seemed stupid to me. And I basically... I uh, was terrified of having to go forward with my, with my education, which my father threatened. So I managed to fail my fourth year of secondary school exams totally and was asked to leave. And nothing could have been better for my future. <laughs> I also remember, the, too, that your, your parents established that Africa was the, was the birthplace of Homo sapiens from where there they went out to colonize the world and also... As a young guy, you used to tell me you used to spend your life in the Serengeti and Aldervai, and one of your big tricks was to hunt, pretend you were an early man and go and hunt hares, and then when you were feeling really brave, you go up after lions and made a kill, just see if you could do it, and scare them like early man would be done. Is that correct? Or were you boasting at school? Well, I think my father thought it would be a good way to prove his theory that early humans were scavengers um, and were able to drive predators off kills. <laughs> um, and I think he thought as he had three sons and they usually had teenage boys with them as friends we should do the experiment and he would observe the consequences um, they do run away provided you time it right you have to wait till they've got a fairly distended stomach it's getting warm and most lions will leave a kill quite happily if 
approached by some youngsters waving branches and shrieking and yelling at them. They don't go far, but far enough for you to be able to prove the experiment and two, to collect some protein, which my father wanted us to take to him. Uh, Richard, you, you then actually, I, you know, I, said your father, I think your father said you could leave school as long as you didn't come to him for any money. And you did like any smart guy, like all of us did, you entered the safari business, you entered the tourist business. And actually, your first job ever was in the safari business. Is that correct? Yes, I, my first um, attempt to earn any money was in the safari business. And I'll, I'll tell you all a funny story. Um, I worked alone and then with Alan Root, the famous wildlife photographer, and we formed a company called Root and Leaky Safaris. It didn't do very well. But at that stage, Jeff and I weren't close, but we knew each other quite well. And he said, Richard, why don't you leave Alan Root and come and work with me? And I'll give you 50% of the business. And we'll call it Leaky and Kent. Leaky and Kent. And I said, no, nah, I don't think you've got any future, Jeff. Um, when I asked him earlier last year whether I could now take up that offer, he said no. So, <laughs> these things happen. But I left the safari business long ago. <laughs> I think we actually said Kent and Leakey. And he said then, he's, he always negotiates. For it. I think he said Leakey and Kent said, no, no, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> Going on, Richard then uh, entered the, became a paleoanthropologist um, in the museum. And his first big expedition, I think, was in 1967 when you went to the Omo River. And there you're, you're promptly attacked by crocodiles in your canoe. Did they get you or anybody near you or not? Well, I think more important than being attacked by crocodiles, we found some very important fossils. But um, Jeffrey obviously thinks that crocodiles are more interesting. <laughs> we were attacked by crocodiles. Um, in those days, there were an awful lot of crocodiles on the Omo River. They're not today. And they were very large and very hungry. And, and although we were attacked, we, we didn't, any of us, get um, caught. I lost my trousers on one attack because they front teeth of the crocodile went through my, my um, trouser belt as we hit the bank and I was catapulted out of the boat and he kept half of my trousers. But that was all right. Um, but more importantly, we did find some important fossils and, and that is really when I decided to make my career in the study of origins. And the fossils we found in 1967 remain to this date the oldest fossilized remains of our species, Homo sapiens, about 200,000 years older, although at the time we weren't aware of the actual date, but we knew they were early. What other discoveries did you make, like um, Tacana Boy? And what were the, well, you, you were in this business for, you know, you were an anthropologist about 20 years, more. So what were the major discoveries that you think you well, made? Well, after, after the Omo in Ethiopia, I moved my efforts back to the Lake Turkana Basin, mm -hmm. um, northern Kenya, uh, where with my wife and my colleagues from the National Museum, we worked and still are working, mm -hmm. and have assembled a vast collection of fossilized remains of early humans stretching back to the very earliest precursors of the human story, it's about four and a half million years. Next week, I think it'll be announced in Nature, major discovery taking the age of stone implements back beyond three million years. Um, there's an enormous amount of new work coming out of the work at Turkana with, with uh, our team. We now have many other teams working up there, and, and it really is a place that I think should become, uh, and we may allude to it later on, somewhere where tourists would go to, travelers would go to, to go to the very place where humanity arose, could be marketed in a way that I think could be very important for Kenya and for your industry. Richard, I remember that I was very proud that I got David Rockefeller to come on safari with me. I remember telling you, and he said, why on earth did he go, want to go with you? And I said, well, he does, actually. And then I said, I know what, why don't I bring him up to see you at Kubifora? And I brought David up there. And I think you, you took us on a fossil hunting expedition, all right? And I think you actually placed a fossil there because Mr. Rockefeller found it. it was frightfully exciting. You said it was some 1.6 million year old fossil. Was that true or did he discover it or did you place it there? Well, I'd have to say I can't remember specifically <laughs> what happened. But I can say I was rather chagrined that David, who became a good friend, was far more interested in bugs than beetles than in fossils, and uh, we decided traveling together would be difficult because what he wanted to see more of were bugs which took a lot of time to find, and I wanted to find fossils, which also took a lot of time to find, but I thought were much more 
satisfactory. I, I think the best part of that whole trip was Richard then said, there's these huge crocodiles wandering outside his camp, mammoth things cruising by. So Richard suddenly says to David, let's, David, let's go for a swim now. And he had, you know, his, his, he had his aide there, Joseph Reed, who later became the ambassador to the UN, who was frightfully concerned, said, you can't have Mr. Rockefeller go for a swim. And David said, well, is it safe? And Richard said, of course it is. And we all went swimming with the crocodile. So Richard, why didn't they bite us? At that time, that lake had so many fish that you could hardly swim. They were bumping into you, and the crocodiles had absolutely no interest in eating um, human flesh. We were just a, a nuisance to them, um, and we swam there several times a day for 25 years, and I let my two-year-old children swim within 20, 30 meters of crocodiles, and there was never the slightest danger. But it's not the same today. Let me go on quickly. Um, he, so that's his second career, safari, safari operator, anthropologist. And then he went into conservation in about 1990. And um, there was an outcry of poaching. I think you may have remembered that time. So what made you actually go into conservation, head up the uh, wildlife conservation management, which then became KWS, Kenya Wildlife Services? Well, I was thoroughly exhausted by the, the infighting in paleoanthropology and running the National Museum of Kenya. And I was very critical of the way the government was handling the wildlife problems in Kenya. And I said that I thought the Kenya government had totally failed in its ability to uh, stop elephant poaching. And the president at the time was President Daniel Arap Moy, and um, he sent for me and said, you've been highly critical of my government. And I said, yes. And he said, well, why don't you take over responsibility for stopping the poaching? So I said, OK, I will. And that's how I changed careers. I had not thought about it. But it seemed to me then, as it still does today, that the slaughter of elephants was being done by a handful of people. And a handful of people was a manageable crisis. We were led to believe that the entire Somali army and the entire middle class element in Kenya were behind the ivory trade. It couldn't have been further from the truth. And today, we're still talking about elephant poaching, although we did stop it, it's come back again. And again, they're saying you can't stop it because China's involved. China isn't poaching, China is simply buying. And if we sorted out our own affairs and we put better intelligence and better police force, you could stop elephant poaching in the next six months, certainly in Kenya, I think across Africa. Well, I think people are going to come to Richard's door again asking him to do that. I want to go back to one thing. I remember that you, you became, again, pretty famous because you burnt 12 tons of ivory in Nairobi National Park at that time with President Daniel Arab Moy. What gave you that idea? What, and you streamed it live to American audiences. Was it a good idea? Um, how, much, how much was it worth? Well, I was concerned that if there was a, a high price on ivory, <coughs> it would be harder to stop the killing, illegal killing. And yet I didn't know how we could bring the price down. <coughs> but I do remember many years before as a teenager, I had learned about a certain woman called Brigitte Bardot. And the reason I remembered her, I think she's the first woman to appear in fairly good magazines wearing no clothes. And <laughs> as a teenage boy, I thought, that's a very interesting person. <laughs> um, many years later, having taught me my anatomy, basic anatomy, um, she decided she was trying to do something to stop people buying spotted cat skins, furs of <coughs> leopard, cheetah, ocelots, and, and, and other um, small carnivores who had spotted cat furs for coats. And she brought together hundreds and hundreds of fur coats in the streets of Paris, and she organized a very high-level publicity event and burnt the lot. It wasn't long after that that any uh, woman in the Western society, at any rate, wearing a fur coat in public would be hissed at. And the wearing of spotted cat furs virtually went out. The market for spotted cats collapsed. And the leopards and the ocelots and the cheetahs came back. And so I thought, well, we might try and do something similar. And so I suggested to my wife that maybe I should burn the ivory for publicity stunt. And she said, did it occur to you that teeth don't burn? Remember the crematoriums? <laughs> well, I thought that would be fixable. 
I asked the president if I could destroy the ivory, which is worth at that time $12 million. And he was a little, no, $3 million, and he's a little concerned. But we've destroyed it. At the time of burning, ivory was worth $150 US dollars a pound, $300 a kilo. Four months after the burning, the price of ivory in the black market was $5 a kilo. The market collapsed, not only in Kenya, but across Africa. And the elephant population in my own country, which I have the numbers for, went from a low of 16,000 animals back up to 28,000 11 years later. It can be done. To, and the idea was to establish that elephant ivory is worthless. Today, a lot of people have suggested we buy the ivory from the government and, and then destroy it. Why buy it? Just ask the government to destroy it. And I think this is happening now. It's happening in China. It's happening in, in, in America. It's happening in many African states. And I think the current thinking is if we're going to save the elephant, we've got to make ivory worthless. And I must say, if we lost our elephants, tourism to African rain states will simply stop. It's selfish economic interest, as well as all the other considerations, that suggest we've got to stop the elephant disappearing. And it can be done. Richard, you went from, you know, from that triumph then to the great misfortune when one day flying your aeroplane, the engine stopped. Um, and you, you were sufficiently good to, to land the plane. And um, I was, you know, I was close to you. I've always been close. And, and you had this bad, bad accident with your legs. And... So what happened? Do you ever know what happened to that? Why you, why you crashed that day? I was pretty certain somebody wanted me dead. Okay. Um, We've all wanted that a long time from school. Yes. Um, it seemed to be what you would call politely an assassination bid. Um, <laughs> I don't know who did it exactly, but it was almost certainly um, orchestrated by those who didn't like what I was doing in my fight against corruption and my unwillingness to share the money I had raised for wildlife, which was about $160 million, to share it with them. Uh, the money I raised was for wildlife, and I didn't want briefcase contractors getting involved in the, the purchase of equipment and buying of airplanes and things like that. So I was not playing a game that, that was popular, and I think it was decided best to get rid of him. Well, they failed. They got rid of my legs, but not me. And um, I'm fine. I stumble a bit here and there, but I'm fine. You even called me out yesterday. He said to me, God, you know, I tripped over today and my ankle's really sore. And I said, oh, really? I said, Come on, Jeff, you know I've got a tin leg. <laughs> <laughs> He's by the way, gullible. By, <laughs> by the way, when Richard was having this, uh, he, he was over in England and we spent quite a lot of time together. And he came to me and said, you know, I'm going to have, uh, have these new legs. And, I, and he said to me, he was becoming a politician by this stage, head of the Secretary General of the Safina Group. And he said, I'm going to have a few inches added to my legs so I can stand up tall in the crowds. Did you do that? You tell Yes, you. I'd, I'd been around six foot before I had the accident, but I came up to six foot two and a half inches. Um, <laughs> and the half was to beat my younger brother. But um, <laughs> if those of you are tall, you don't know the problem. If those of you are short as you are with the legs that are off here, you need to get up a bit to have any authority. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. At least something good came out of it. Yes, right? very good. <laughs> Richard, you, I know you've just, you know, we were all very concerned about Africa, about tourism there, about Kenya in particular. Um, you've just spent some time with the, with the president of Kenya, President Kenyatta. Maybe you can tell us a little bit after this Garissa incident what we're doing about security. Maybe bring us some good and encouraging words about Kenya and tourism to Kenya. Well, I think there's no question. That, that Kenya has a problem in that we do have a very large part of our country that is dominated by people of, of Somali descent. And it's very hard to distinguish those who may be inclined to extremism from the normal Kenyan Somali who are living peacefully and have for the last several hundred years. Um, Garissa was, I think, a complete uh, shocker for all of us. Uh, it was handled very badly by our security forces, but I think the, the Kenyan president has done a lot uh, to tighten that up. Um, there will probably be more. Terrorism is something that, that I don't think we can stop in the short term. But I think the point I want to make is that whilst we do have incidents, shopping malls, we do have incidents in colleges and schools, 
the Kenya that the tourist wishes to see is not an area where terrorists are likely to go or even try to go because of the heightened security that is provided by the Kenya Wildlife Service. And I think what worries me is that um, Kenya is unsafe is not true. Parts of Kenya would be unwise to visit. But I just wish we could get a better understanding collectively that you shouldn't avoid... In fact, they, when there was Ebola in West Africa, three and a half thousand miles away, people wouldn't come to Kenya unless, for fear of catching Ebola. There's no chance of that. I think Africa is just painted as a broad swathe, and I think we've got to recognize that Kenya and many other African countries are rapidly growing. We've got an increasing um, middle-income group. I remember I was in, in, in um, China in 1972 in, in the height of the Cultural Revolution, and being told, well, China's going to be in, in, in the doldrums forever. Look at the mess they've done with their cultural heritage and everything else. Look where China is today. I would predict that a continent of close to a billion people in 10, 15 years will be what you're talking about in terms of new markets. And I think the early worm is the, the early bird catches the worm. And I think it's a pity to write Africa off broadly. Yeah, there are places that aren't right. But I was talking with President Kenyatta a few days ago, and um, we were talking about the fact that the, uh, there's a plan to make a, a movie in Kenya, and um, the movie makers are worried. And the President said, look, tell them that we can guarantee their protection, tell them if it's too expensive, and he gave me a list of things he would do, including waiving all entry fees, waiving all immigration charges, waiving this and waiving that to make it the most, at the moment, the most attractive place to film in Africa because we want to get Kenya back on the map. And I live, I've got children, I've got grandchildren. Kenya's not unsafe. Um, the biggest problem we have is traffic getting to the airport. It's a fine place to come to. Uh, well, Richard, he's so modest, you know, not telling really, and then Nick referred to it. But this movie is about Richard, all right? I'm, you know, this really, I'm, this actually distresses me a lot. It's going, to be, it's going to be called Africa. It's about Richard. Uh, Brad Pitt is going to play Richard. Um, I don't think he's as handsome as you. Certainly not as charismatic. Do you, do you worry about that? <laughs> Carry on. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, Ange Angelina Jolie is playing your wife, and That's Meryl right. Streep is playing your mother, Mary, who I knew well. Well, I think in Hollywood you have to say probably, because nothing happens until it's happened. OK. But there is a plan to make a movie um, focused on my career, shortened, dealing with human origins and Africa being the birthplace of humanity, and then my, my fight to save Africa's elephants and wildlife. And there's a sort of mix within all that about the slightly exaggerated romantic missions that I went on. <laughs> Um, and that's why he's jealous, <laughs> because I've got away with it and it's going to be dramatized. How could it be, how could it be, how it be exaggerated, it. Richard? <laughs> oh, easily. <laughs> Angelina promised me that she'd leave me looking quite good. <laughs> Richard, a very good, do you think, actually I'm being serious now, do you think a movie made like this with Brad Pitt, do you think this is going to help, is there going to be a message in there to help African countries, to help anti-poaching and to help all these things that give us problems. This is a, going to be an incredible vocal piece to get out there. Do you think well, you'll do I think, that? I mean, I, mean I, I wanted this movie made not because I want to appear as a hero, but because if somebody like Brad Pitt is seen in countries like China, talking about the importance of preserving the elephant, talking about the, the, the value of wildlife tourism, even though I've said it a hundred times, nobody listens. But if he says it, and he's, he's supported by some superstars like his wife, many people, particularly in other cultures, are going to say, that's important. And I think it could make a huge difference to our efforts to, to bring uh, the, the African wildlife scene back from the brink. I was watching some of the, 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 the presentations today. We don't have castles. We don't have ports with fishing fleets. We don't have many of the things that European tourism has. But we do have spectacular wildlife still. 
We do have the um, cultural heritage and in particular uh, the world heritage sites where these fossils are coming from. And if we were clever and if we marketed it and if we got our security right, there's absolutely no reason why African countries, particularly East Africa and in specifically Kenya, shouldn't be right up at the top again with increasing numbers of tourist travel, uh, miles flown, and be a much more vibrant part of your conferences. I'm very distressed to see how few uh, East Africans and Africans are taking part in these discussions. Richard, uh, to close, Turkana Basin Institute, which is your recent, um, your, re your new home, and you have the, you know, the science park there, and I spent a lovely few days with you and Meeve. Tell us more about it and what you plan to achieve there in the long term. Well, I think what it is, I, I realize that working in the deserts of Kenya, while I love it and it's very beautiful and very stark, it's, it's not the best place for most people to spend time. So we have built a very comfortable, expansive uh, research facility. We have scientists from many parts of the world, ranging from China uh, to, to South America to, to Europe, coming to work with Kenyans uh, in the Research Institute, uh, pursuing some of the, the, the discoveries we made and new discoveries are being made. And it is changing the focus of research on human origins from, if you like, Nairobi-based or elsewhere to where the fossils are found. And the stakeholder interest in having the researchers come to Turkana has already beginning to generate new development. And I hope in the next um, two or three years, I will build a, a very large, significant uh, museum celebrating, and I suppose one could say celebrating, the fact that the cradle of humanity is in fact Lake Turkana and give an opportunity for countless thousands, if not millions of people over the coming decades to actually visit where they came from. If you don't believe me, get your DNA tested and you'll find everyone in this room came from somewhere very close to Turkana within the last 60,000 years. So when you come, you're actually coming home to see where you came. And this is a sort of pilgrimage tourism that I think we can generate. You know, what I love about Richard, he always has a new idea. I haven't quite, what he has is always a great new idea. He's written eight books. He's going to do 100 more things in his life. And um, I'm, he's a dear friend. And thank you, Richard. You, you really have saved our animals. The pictures, you know, Richard is, is a hero for all of us. He fights the fight, he gets out there, and he's wildlife's best friend. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you.